We continue on in Genesis chapter 31 today. I'm going to pick up in verse 4. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know how I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, The spotted shall be your wages, then the flock bore spotted. And if he said, The striped shall be your wages, then the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in a the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land, and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us. And he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock and all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Then Laban Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. Verse 20, And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. Verse 21, He fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. Now we see here a lot going on, but did you notice the tone of what's going on? Jacob speaks about some things, and we're going to hash it out. But he, he's speaking in a way favorably about himself and in a condemning way of Laban. He's making himself look better, and his wives as well. They're mad at their father. Now bear in mind, this will be for, for next time, but bear in mind in verse 19 that Rachel stole her father's household gods. I'm not really going to hit on that particular point too much today. Next time we'll get to that. But we see Jacob, you know, we, we've seen that the Lord has told him to go. So what does he do? He goes to his wives. Now, I, I want to make a clear distinction. Many commentaries and many Bible teachers I've heard that have preached on this passage teach it not in an interpretation manner, but in an application manner. Here's what I mean. I, I've not seen very many walk through this passage ver- verse by verse. What I've seen the vast majority do is talk about principles and application of, well, if God speaks to you, you know, then your circumstances are going to align. You know, Laban's sons and Laban didn't like uh, Jacob anymore. God's going to speak to you clearly. You have that. You need to cling to God's word. He's going to remind you of what he's promised you in the past. You cling to God's promise. You go to your wife, and your wife's counsel should match up. And it goes through all these quote-unquote principles of application, but I really believe that is an application of the passage, and it misses interpreting this passage correctly. Because what's going on is Jacob has worked to steal the flock of Laban. We saw him manipulating. He was selectively breeding back in chapter 30. Now, yes, God in his sovereignty and his providence is the one that was sovereign over conception and birth, and he allowed Jacob to obtain the wealth of Laban. He knew that Laban was mistreating Jacob. But Jacob is not in the clear as much as he kind of says. You know, he's kind of like, well, your dad, ladies, has been doing this to me. Really what's happening, though, is Jacob is angry at Laban, and so are his wives. They are disgruntled. They are even hateful in a sense. His wives say that, you know, our father sold us. All of his wealth really belongs to us and our children. And Jacob sets in verse 20, it clearly says, And Jacob tricked Laban by not telling him that he intended to flee. We still see in this passage a very clear teaching that Jacob is still in the process of his manipulating ways, of his trickster ways. His very name means deceiver, trickster. He's still living that way. It's not going to be until over in near the end of chapter 32 that we see Jacob wrestle with God. His manipulation ends up having to wrestle with God Almighty. He, he literally wrestles with God in the flesh. 
with the theophany, a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus Christ. He wrestles with God. And we're going to see what happens there. The Lord is going to change his name. And the Lord is going to change his, his character. Jacob right now is known as the manipulator and deceiver. It's been everything. And I'll, I'll recap that in just a moment as we look at the pattern in his life. But it's going to be changed after he encounters and wrestles with God. His struggle with God will result in him being broken, humbled, and given a new wisdom. His character changes. Let me just kind of recap what we've seen about Jacob's life. Number one, we saw back in the womb, Jacob and Esau were struggling. And their mother sought the Lord about what was going on. God said there were two nations within her. The older would serve the younger. They were twins. Jacob came out grabbing onto Esau's heel. They were fighting even back then from, the, from before they were ever even born. Jacob's manipulation is very clearly seen in that he, when Esau came in famished from the field, Jacob had a pot of red bean stew, and he told Esau, I'll give it to you, but you've got to sell me your birthright. He was manipulating his brother when his brother was hungry. Uh, Jacob went along with his mother to deceive his father Isaac for the family blessing, for the blessing of the firstborn son. That produced a lot of anger. Jacob then flees Esau and goes to Laban and Jacob gets a dose of his own medicine Laban deceives J Jacob when he goes to marry Rachel instead he ends up finding Leah there in the morning laying beside him he's very irate he ends up getting two wives because he he does not want the wife that he got instead of accepting what happened and even though he may have not liked it instead of loving the wife that God had given him who we saw and talked about before had you know, Leah had better character than Rachel. We're going to see played out through her entire life a, a very selfish and deceptive bent, a very mean-spirited lady. She may have been knocked dead beautiful, but she was a viper. But Jacob pressed on to get a second wife because of that. His wives, in return, are manipulating one another. Their sister wives married to the same man, fighting for his affections. Jacob does not really love Leah through most of the time. He, he I mean, Leah buys Jacob, uh, Jacob's attention with mandrakes from Rachel. We saw that just recently. And the two sisters are not only vying back and forth and fighting back and forth, but they even use their maidservants to get back at their husband and to have surrogate mothers to try to stash up more children in their favor to win their husband's affection. Jacob manipulated Laban. Jacob wanted to go home. He completed his service of 14 years to pay off the dowry for his wives. All these children are born. And right as that's being completed, Joseph is born. Jacob's ready to go home. And he goes to Laban and says, let me take my wives, my kids, and go. And Laban's like, no, I've divined. You know, I've sought the signs. I've learned by divination that God has blessed me because of you. And so stay, name your wages. And Jacob manipulatively responds, well, don't give me anything. But what about this? Any of the stripe is speckled of the flock. I read one... Uh, commentary which provided some insight on that the speckled and spotted of the flock were most likely the less common of the sheep more likely the sheep would more likely be a black or a white colored solid colored sheep so it was less likely for there to be striped and yet Jacob we already read in chapter 30 would set those poles he knew about breeding techniques he you know we know that Abraham and Isaac both had had uh, large flocks and there was a large part of their wealth Jacob knows about these things and it's said that he would set those poles out when the strong were mating he would not put them out when the weak were mating around the water and so he selectively used manipulation to gain the wealth there we've seen all of that happen and then we saw Laban getting downcast his bed uh, Jacob's brother-in-law is getting angry about the fact that, Le that Jacob had taken their wealth. But we saw most clearly that God said go. Jacob had wanted it to go before, and he used that opportunity to manipulate. Laban's like, no, stay. Oh, okay, I, I can get some money out of this. Now, it wasn't actually silver and gold, but Jacob was, it, it appears, motivated by what he could gain for wealth. He stayed, he did that. But yet, here we see Jacob plotting with his wives, calling them secretly to himself in the field, making himself out kind of to be the hero. I mean, it's pretty clear that he's shedding a positive light on himself. He's not repenting of his own manipulations. He's having no sorrow for his past or his manipulating ways. And 
his wives go right along with him and how can they manipulate their father and yeah everything really belongs to us uh, entitlement mentality definitely a selfish mentality it's a negative light on jacob and his wives jacob ultimately we saw in verse 20 tricks laban by silently planning to run to flee so what we again see here is really the most powerful lesson i think the application instead of that stuff that some preachers say about you know circumstances need to align and your counsel of your wives and i, I kind of mentioned some of that really I, I don't see any evidence for taking that as an interpretation of this passage it's an application of this passage and i don't even see it being a sound application I mean, really, it, it's ignoring the details about studying the life of Jacob and the clear pattern that Scripture is portraying of him being this manipulating person up until his struggle with God where he emerges, if you will, a changed man, a redeemed man, a saved man who literally wrestles with Jesus Christ. Pre-incarnate in a theophany. We're going to talk about that later on, as several uh, episodes ahead, Lord willing. But I think the most powerful lesson and application we have is that God can turn any type of person around. The gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ can get a hold of anybody. Even a trick, tricking, manipulating, deceptive person like Jacob can be redeemed by Jesus Christ, be broken of their sin, find humility, and have God-given wisdom. That is what we will see Jacob changed into later on. And he will even be given a new name. And I don't want to get too far ahead, but I just keep looking forward to that moment because that's where Scripture continues to, to seem to point as we're studying Jacob's life. But let us break this down. I know we are a little longer today, but there's so much contained here, and I, I could not see a way to, to break it apart without losing its substance. We saw in verse 4 where we picked up that Jacob calls Rachel and Leah to the field. He talks about the fact that, you know, your dad's not respecting me. But he speaks about God. Here's another clear indication he's not surrendered to God yet. He says, but the God of my father has been with me. He still, he believes in the existence of God, but he's not personally serving God. He still identifies God far off. Well, he's the God of my father. You know, he may even be thinking of the stories he's heard, or perhaps even heard of Abraham, about God being faithful to Abraham as well. Perhaps that's going through his mind. But he certainly has seen God in the life of his father Isaac, who was offered, was being offered on that uh, as a sacrifice on that altar by Abraham, and yet God intervened to send an angel and said no. And powerful lessons were taught there, foreshadowing the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of, of God offering his own son for us, for our redemption. We saw in verse 6 that Jacob makes himself appear very favorable. You know that I have served our your father with all my strength. I have worked hard, and yet he's cheated me. He's changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. I can almost hear the tone in, in Jacob's voice. But God didn't allow him to harm me. And he, he talks about, you know, well, if this is going to be your wages. Then that is what the flock's for. God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In God's sovereignty, yes. But... Did God give them to Jacob as a blessing? Or did God give them to Jacob in spite of Jacob's sinful ways? God's ultimate plan is to bless the descendants of Abraham to build the nation of Israel. Israel is the name that Jacob will, will eventually get in chapter 32 by the Lord himself. His name will be changed. And it has a powerful message with what that name means. The Jewish people are known by the name Israel. It's a powerful, powerful lesson here. But God's blessing of Jacob, there's nothing in the text that indicates that it is because God is um, blessing in the sense of affirming and like giving a thumbs up good job to Jacob. No, there's no indication of that in the text. The only thing we see is when Jacob mentions, well, I've had a dream. I've had a dream about the spot of the model, you know, getting the type of, of flocks that I've gotten. And... The angel said to me, Jacob, I said, here I am, lift up your eyes, all the goats that make are, you know, this this way, stripes, spot, and model. I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. It's true, the Lord reaffirms, he's seen that Laban is manipulating Joseph as well. But still, Jacob's manipulating ways, his sin, has not been dealt with by the Lord until over in chapter 32. 
God very clearly reveals himself. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and made a vow to me. Remember how, notice how even God is speaking to himself. I am the God of Bethel, the God that you made a vow to. Jacob's not serving God yet. Look at the very way God uses these terms. So why is God not disciplining Jacob's manipulation and sin? Well, he's not God's child yet. He's not surrendered. He's not, quote unquote, been saved yet. He's not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to, but it's not yet. The Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 12 that God disciplines those he loves. He disciplines his children. If God does not discipline you, you are illegitimate children. You're not his children. God is not disciplining Jacob yet. I believe the clear reason why, based on Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, is because Jacob is not his child yet. God in his sovereignty works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. For his kids, for those that he is calling to salvation, he causes all those things to work together for his purposes and his good. I think so often of you know how this plays out in our lives. Someone is living a life of sin far away from God. They have no they may believe in the existence of God, but they have no relationship, no surrender to the Lord. They're living how they want. They I mean I could use numerous examples. They may be living a life of, of all types of drugs and theft and whatever. They're building the thing. They have the best, it seems, of all the stuff in the world, but they've not been broken over their sin yet. And God allows them to obtain many blessings and many things. But it's really all worthless. Because they don't have the Lord. They don't have salvation. They don't have eternity sealed and secure by the blood of Jesus Christ. But when they come to the Lord, God forgives their entire past. He humbles them. And He changes their character. From the inside out, He changes the heart. That's the powerful thing we're going to see take place in the life of Jacob. We continue on here. Now the most important part, I think, is verse 13. Now God says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed me to vow to me. But then he very clearly tells his wives, God said, Now rise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. The Lord told him to go. Now his wives are going to say down in verse 16, Whatever God has said to you, do. And then they also say, All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. And they clearly acknowledge God is the one who has given them the wealth. Now again, I, I don't... I don't believe, based on the way the text reads, I do not believe that they are acknowledging this about God in a, in a favorable or humble or thankful sense. I think they're saying it more in, in like a sense of God's the Almighty and He gave our Father what He deserves. You know, God has treated, the, the, I mean, the, the daughters look at their father Laban and believe He's treated them like foreigners. He sold them. Their husband has had to work to pay off the dowry. They're, they have received no dowry. Usually, um, in, in those ancient cultures, the father would receive a payment of a dowry for his daughters, but he would also give them some type of, of dowry. And what that money sometimes was, was if their husband would divorce them, the wives would have something to live on, at least for a while. It was kind of the security that the wives at least had their own money. But they're being treated like slaves. Some commentators I read kind of pointed that out. I don't know for certain if that's why they have the indication they have, but, but it is very clear that they feel that they've been treated like slaves, like they've been sold. Their husband has worked hard and slaved away, and they've simply become the servants of their father. They've worked for free for all these many years, for almost two decades, Jacob has served Laban. It's only in the past that he's now finally gotten some wages, even though he had to maybe kind of fudge the numbers or, or quote-unquote manipulate things to get what he got. Nonetheless, his wives side with him in a very mean-spirited way as the the feeling of the text. And then Jacob arose. He sets his sons and his wives on camels. Notice what it says about how he sends his livestock away. He drove away all the livestock and all the property that he had gained. The livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram. He sets out. Laban had gone to shear his sheep. Rachel steals her household, the household gods of Laban. And Jacob tricks Laban. By not telling him that he intends to flee, he simply flees with all that he has. He drives ahead of him and rows. He crosses the Euphrates and sets his face toward the hill country of Gilead. We still see Jacob 
consumed with himself. Now he does obey the Lord to go out from Laban. But let me ask you this. Did he honor God in the way that he left? I think that's the application for us. Remember we're following our SOAP acronym. Scripture. Observation. Observing what Scripture itself says and endeavoring to interpret it based on what Scripture says by observing the text. Not jumping to application too quickly. But then application. How does this apply to our lives? I trust you'll spend some time wrestling with that in your own life because looking at the life of Jacob may convict you. I know reading about Jacob can convict me sometimes. Have I? Okay, I've been obedient to God to go. Have I left though the way God wants me to? That's a convicting question. Have I acknowledged God as the one that's sovereign and given me what I have, but you know, am I really acknowledging that with thankfulness? Or more like, ha! They got what they deserved, and I got a piece of the pie. I was treated horribly. Uh, do I mean-spiritedly say that? It's a convicting question. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you will take this life of Jacob, and Lord, apply these lessons to our lives. Lord, convict us, I ask today, powerfully by your word, transform us. Through the example we see in Jacob's life, Father, change our hearts. Let us not be like Jacob and in the same path that he walked. But let us repent. Let us be transformed, Lord. Humble us. Break our sin. Convict us. And in the power of your Spirit, help us to walk in newness of life as the new creations you have called us to be in Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you. And Father, the most important thing I ask for every person listening is that they surrender to you, that they stop struggling against you and for their own agenda and that they surrender to God. And Father, if there are believers here who have been backsliding, God, I pray that the song of their life would stop being I surrender some and instead would be I surrender all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.